five that changed his life. Since joining Toastmasters, Scott has earned a Master of Science in Organizational Leadership, where his thesis grew into a book, his book into a business, and his business into a calling. He's a nine-time club president, eight-time vice president education, and is the current Division B director for District 11. More importantly, he has been moved seven times to be exact. Orlando to Fort Lauderdale, back to Orlando, and finally to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Two states, three districts, five divisions, eight areas, 11 clubs, and enough second place finishes at district content to make Susan Lucy blush. <laughs> Along the way, Scott has learned a very valuable lesson. Toastmasters, like life, is a game. And like life, you get to choose the game you play. Please help me welcome Advanced Communicator Gold, Advanced Leader Brown, Scott Brown, as he helps us to learn how to play a different game. Toastmaster. Sometimes stuff goes wrong and you just figure it out. Right? So let me ask you, how do you tell time? Do you tell time by the quantity of the minutes ticking by on an oversized clock in the back of the room? Or do you tell time by the moments and the memories that tell the story of your life? Because sometimes those moments, those moments make us laugh. Sometimes they make us cry. Sometimes they make our ears bleed. <laughs> and sometimes they are fleeting. Gone like a whisper in the wind before we ever truly experience them in the first place. I think one of the great measures of time in those moments are the experiences you have in different places, with different spaces, but always with the people you love. And if anybody knows about different places, it's me. Because yes, in the past seven years, I have moved a number of times, but that doesn't tell the story. Because when we moved into our house this year, it was my 43rd move of my life. No, never the military. May or may not be on the lamb. <laughs> I am on stage, like I'd admit that here. <laughs> may or may not be in witness protection. That's just what someone in witness protection would say. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> no, we are just corporate vagabonds traveling the country for the next promotion, always looking for the next opportunity, and most importantly, always saying yes. We say yes. In 2010, January 2010, I found myself living in Orlando, Florida for the third time. For the third time. Life repeats itself sometimes. And I was the weak link on a drinking team with a bowling problem. <laughs> You've seen me bowl. I'm one of the few people that almost didn't graduate college because I couldn't bowl. That's a thing. After coming back, after throwing yet another gutter ball, 
my friend Joe turned to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about playing softball? <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. When you look at me, your first thought is, that is the body of a finely tuned athlete. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> but it once was. Because while I'm no longer a finely tuned athlete, the layers of experience and pizza <laughs> have hidden the athlete within me. But at one time I did play college baseball. So softball shouldn't be that big of a stretch, right? Because I'm always inspired. I love baseball. I love softball. One of my favorite memories, my favorite images in the world, are when you go to a field first thing in the morning when it's freshly chopped. <laughs> When all that you see is that beautiful dirt contrasting with the dew in the outfield welcoming you to a new day and a new possibility. There's no footprints of children's dreams. There's no marks of their sorrow from their losses. And there's no expectation of their adulation from their wins. All it is is just a field of possibility. But it had been 21 years since I had picked up a ball. I was literally twice the man I used to be. <laughs> and when we went to play softball, I was rusty to say the least. I paid my way through college by being able to throw a baseball past people as a pitcher. Now I couldn't make the throw from third to first. I actually couldn't make the throw from second to first. Or from the pitcher's mound to first. <laughs> they were like, so, you came to play softball. Have you ever thought of bowling? <laughs> but at some point in the year, my friend Joe said, hey, why don't you try to pitch? You used to pitch. And I realized that the same motion that I used to throw gutter balls is the same motion you used to pitch a softball. And I was good. So that year, we won our league championship in softball. Not because I was a great pitcher, but because they were really good behind me. <laughs> and after the season was over, it's a little bit sad, and I remember I was standing beside my Jeep, and I'm standing there with a beer in one hand and a bag of excuses in the other, trying to explain to my new friends how I managed to strike out in slow pitch softball. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> And as we're standing there bantering back and forth, my friend's wife walks by me. Now, Gina is the perfect Southern Belle, because Orlando, Florida is the place where you find some of those perfect Southern Belles. <laughs> she was all a five foot one, 110 pounds, and was the kind of woman that Scarlett O'Hara would have just said, well, bless her heart, that's my friend. <laughs> and she walked past me. And as she did, she stopped and turned and said, thank you so very much for agreeing to coach the boys' baseball team. <laughs> uh. What? <laughs> <laughs> they are just tickle pink to have someone of your stature <laughs> coaching them this year. Now remember, first practice, Tuesday at 5.30. Don't be late. I had just been voluntold. <laughs> you know, it's the way that many of you became club officers. <laughs> It's that act of volunteering someone to do the thing that you know needs done, but you have no intention of doing yourself. <laughs> hey, you ran for office. How about doing this other thing instead? Thank you. So like many of you, when you were voluntold, what did you do? You said yes, right? We say yes. So on Tuesday at 5.30, I pull up to the same field where I had just struck out twice to meet my new soft baseball team. And I got out of my car, and I carried my bucket of balls over and laid it beside that freshly chalked line and looked out over the field. And what did I see? 
but Disney's seven dwarfs. <laughs> Plus their three cousins, itchy, scratchy, and clumsy. <laughs> they were less than 10 years old, all of them, between eight and 10. And they weren't like the athletic eight and 10 year old kids. They were like the, someone's got to coach them eight and 10 year old kids. <laughs> they were the ones small for their age, but with a huge heart. And I went over and introduced myself to all of them. And when I met my team, I was met by a cast of characters that would have made Walt blush. I met Danny, two-fisting Danny, because Danny ran up to me. And he was so excited. He said, coach, coach, I'm ready to play baseball for the first time. And I looked at him like, Danny, that's great. Why are you wearing, hmm? So I noticed. On his left hand, Danny was wearing a brand new Mizuno baseball glove. And on his right hand, Danny was wearing a brand new Wilson baseball glove. <laughs> he was like a live action version of Sebastian the Crab. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome, but how are you, what are you, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna throw? With my hands, coach! I found my right fielder! <laughs> At least he'll stop everything. Yay! And then I met Sid. Sid had just moved to Orlando with his family from India. And his first words to me were, oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to play American cricket. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sid's parents knew nothing about American cricket. So he borrowed his father's soccer cleats. His dad is my size. He had on seven pairs of socks. And when he ran, his shoes would fly off. Oh, thanks, Sid. You're going to bunt a lot this year. But my favorite player of all, my favorite one of all, was Marco. Marco ran up to me. All right. I ran up to Marco, and I said, Marco, welcome to the team. And he said, I hate baseball. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Marco was there because his parents said he was going places in baseball. He hoped those places were home. <laughs> <laughs> But he was on the team, and we knew we were going to have an interesting season. So the first practice went exactly like you would think with a bunch of kids that had never played before. There wasn't a lot of catching, but there was a lot of chasing. <laughs> and at the end of practice, I figured the one thing all these kids can do, they're 10. They have energy. Let's make them run. They'll have a race. It'll be fun, right? <laughs> it will be fun. So I divided the team up. Half the kids, second base. Half the kids, home plate. Give them each a baseball. And the goal is, when I say go, both of you take off running and you touch all four bases and then hand the ball to the next person in line. And the goal is to beat the other team to get back to your base at the end of the line by the time you're done. Five kids on each team. I was like, this is great. Yay, we're going to go. All right, everyone got it? Good. Break. And I stood at the pitcher's mound. I'm like, second base, ready? Yes. Home plate. Ready? Yes. On your mark, get set, go. And the first two up were Danny and Marco. Danny took off as fast as he could. Marco took off as fast as he could. And when, they, when Marco got the third base, he had about a three-step lead on Danny. And when he got the third base, he hit the bag and went into superhero mode. Slow action. <laughs> superhero mode. <laughs> Actual speed. <laughs> Marco, running, home. 17 minutes. <laughs> the rest of the team had not just finished the race, but had left the field. <laughs> well, a funny thing happens when you coach Little League Baseball. No matter how bad your team is, they expect you to actually show up and play the games. I wish that wasn't true, but it is. First game of the year, we show up, our team looks just like you would think, and we're playing my friend Joe's team. First game of the year. 
I have two assistant coaches, and in the third inning, things had already gotten out of control. Really out of control. We had a six run limit on how many runs you could score per inning. So by the time we hit the third inning, we were already down 18 nothing. <laughs> we hadn't gotten out yet. Marco was in left field, and at the end of the second inning, he came in and he said, Coach, why do I have to go chase the ball to the fence every time? Can't we just wait and get them all at once? <laughs> it's a reasonable request, wouldn't you say? <laughs> kind of makes sense. I'm like, well, no. <laughs> so we go off for the bottom of the third inning, and we're getting slaughtered. And I look out in the field before it starts, and I'm like, huh. I'm missing some. Where's Mark? Hey, have you seen Marco? And my coach is like, not my job. I thought that was your job. I'm like, come on, you have one job. Find the players. And I look out, I'm like, where is Marco? Marco! And from the tall grass in left field, Marco sat up. <laughs> Marco had gotten tired of chasing and decided it's more fun to lay down and make oh, smile angels in the grass. <laughs> Marco, come on. You've got to say, come on, Marco, what are you doing? He's like, oh, okay, I'll get up. There was a hush that fell over the audience as he stood up. And as he rose out of that tall grass, like a meerkat in the savannah, <laughs> Marco, sit back down. Marco, where are your pants? <laughs> Our 0-21 record that year really doesn't tell the story. <laughs> we were so bad that even Chico's bail bond said, nope, not sponsoring you. <laughs> but something magical happened because at every practice that year, I didn't practice based upon the fact that we were going to get slaughtered and we weren't going to win any games. I tried to teach them how to do something new. With Danny, I taught him how to catch with one hand and throw with the other. With Sid, I taught him how to tie his shoes more tightly, and we learned how to bunt from Sid. Did you know cricket makes the best bunters in the world? <laughs> it's amazing. <clears throat> that last game, we were back playing Danny's team, and the unthinkable happened. It's the bottom of the last inning. We're winning by one run. 17 to 16. It's a pitcher's duel. <laughs> Nick had learned to throw that year. He had learned how to throw a strike. And I thought, this is going to be great. But before that last inning, Marco's mom pulled me aside and said, hey, can you please just do me a favor? All Marco's wanted to do all year is play catcher. This last inning, can you let him play catcher? Now, neither of us had any expectation that he could catch. <laughs> but she said something that was important. She said, the catcher's equipment makes him feel like a superhero. And I thought, at least he'll be wearing pants. <laughs> so I put him in the catcher, and I thought, even if we lose, what does it matter? But we had a chance to win. Base is loaded. Coach's son's on second base. Fastest runner on their team's on third base. Nick rears back and throws a perfect pitch. The batter does what batters do at nine years old. Closed his eyes. <laughs> Marco did what Marco does. Closed his eyes. As the ball bounced past Marco, through the umpire's legs, and went to the backstop, the runner on third broke for home. Down the line he came. But the ball didn't just bounce to the backstop. It hit the backstop in a way that lofted it in this beautiful rainbow arc. And with Marco's eyes still closed, it landed right in his hands. <laughs> Marco! Marco, tag the runner! Tag the runner! And Marco looked as the first runner came across the plate and ran to the dugout. Marco went after him. Marco, the other runner, the other runner. 
So Marco, in superhero mode, started running towards the other runner. <laughs> Actual speed, yet again. Well, the coach's son's coming on the third base line. He's like, oh, no, and tried to stop and fell down. Marco, Marco, tag the runner, tag the runner. And as Marco got close, I'm like, this is going to be it. We're going to have a tie. We're not going to be perfect. And he reached out with the ball in one hand, his glove in the other, and he dropped the glove. Then he dropped the ball. And he reached out and tagged the runner. And he said, you're it! And he went out. Only that wasn't a true story. <laughs> At the end of the game, I gathered all the parents, all the players, like I did after every game. We went down the first baseline, sat down, and team mom brought out all the snacks. Kids love snacks, they'll pay attention for food. <laughs> sat them all down, and after every game, I'd ask them, what did you learn today? What did you learn this week? Well, this time I asked them, what did you learn this year? And I wasn't expecting their responses. Danny said, I learned that excitement is good, but choice is better. He ended up being a lefty. He couldn't catch a, he couldn't catch a cold, but <laughs> man, could that kid throw. <laughs> then Sid said, I learned that if you're good at one thing, maybe you might be good at something similar in a different place. It's like, who are these kids? <laughs> and then Marco went last and Marco said, Coach, I learned something this year. I learned it's good to keep your pants on in public. <laughs> he was 10, I guess, what could I expect? And I turned to the parents and I said, guys, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought we had a chance today, I thought we would do and they stopped me in mid-sentence. They stopped me and said, stop. You have nothing to apologize for. There is no other person those kids would play for and no other person that would coach those kids, which was true. <laughs> <laughs> then they said something that completely changed my outlook. One of them looked at me and said, nice guys don't finish last. They're just playing a different game. Nice guys don't finish last. They're just playing a different game. And oh, were they playing a different <laughs> game. <laughs> In life, we have these expectations about all these games that we play, but we don't necessarily understand what those games are. There's really two types of games that we all play throughout life. We have formal games, and informal games. Formal games are those things with set rules, set expectations, a set way to score. We know who the players are, we know where they're gonna go, we know what's gonna happen. Like bowling is a game, baseball is a game, softball is a game, Monopoly is a game, tic-tac-toe is a frustrating game. <laughs> but they're games, they're formal games. Informal games are different. Informal games are the games we play that don't have set rules. We don't know how we keep score, but yet we continue to put our effort in to get better at something. So let me give you a good example of one of the best differences between formal games and informal games. School. How many of you are parents? Fantastic. If you're not a parent, how many of you had parents? <laughs> Perfect. So you understand the concept of parents. Now, as parents, whether you were a parent or are a parent, did you, was there an expectation that you wanted your child to do well in school? Anybody say, no, I wanted them to be awful. Perfect. It's not a thing. But how did you know if they were doing well in school? Grades. Absolutely. Is gra are grades a formal game or an informal game? Formal. formal. We know the rules. We know how to keep score. There's a grade point average. You know how to calculate that. We know who's going to be number one in the class. There is a set formula for how you keep score within the game of grades. But is that really the game of school? 
or is the game of school learning? How many of you are still learning at something? How many of you get a grade on what you're learning all the time? It's an <coughs> informal game. Now I, as a naysayer, as a child, played a different game. <laughs> My parents thought, the way that we should keep score is through your grades, and we want you to get straight A's. I said, I would rather get a straight flush. <laughs> one A, one B, one C, one D, one F, and one incomplete. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to manage your homework and test scores to get a B and a D? Like the A's are easy, you get everything right. The F's are easy, you get everything wrong. The C's are easy, you get half the stuff. B's and D's? That's hard. I was proud of myself. My parents were so proud of me that they gave me an entire semester to think about it in my room by myself. <laughs> there may or may not have been a wooden spoon involved. Oh, oh you know. <laughs> I was playing a different game. The difference is, did I learn or was I just focused on a different game? I did the work. I did the homework. I just managed the outcome differently. I thought it'd be fun to see if I could graduate in the exact middle of my class. <laughs> I wanted to be the midpoint. 525 kids. I wanted to be in the middle. <laughs> the middle. Half above, half below. It's hard to do. Colleges don't really understand that game, though. <laughs> Anybody work in higher education? If you have a kid's Scranton script that is in the exact middle, how excited are you? Like, just, just like my parents. But I graduated high school in 1986. Yeah, do the math, that makes me 52. And at the time, the top ACT score you could get was 30. I got 27 and a half. Obviously, I learned some stuff. I got 1,600, I got 1,550 on my SATs. I had learned some stuff. I just had managed a different game. Well, I stayed with those kids because I realized those kids were just playing a different game. Some of them were playing tag. <laughs> But they were all playing a different game and they had an opportunity to learn and grow, so I stayed with them. I coached them, I coached their brothers, my wife coached their sisters, and I stayed their coach from the time they were eight until they were 14. And along the way, they got better. The last year I coached them, in Florida we played spring ball and fall ball because we don't have that thing called snow. <laughs> we can find a white baseball in the outfield in February. <laughs> That last year I coached, for some of them, was the 12th season they had played for me. Now you would think that bad team was probably still, eh, probably a bad team. But we went into the last week of that season with a 17-1 and record. Ooh. <laughs> Danny learned to throw. 17-1. <laughs> and in the championship series with the best of three, we played the, ch we played the winner from the previous term. And he had won every age division since his kids were six. His name was Chino, and his wife was the director of the league. Chino never lost. How do you think that first game went? We won 17 to three. Ooh. <laughs> now, in base, Little League Baseball, there are these rules about how many innings you can pitch, how long you can pitch. We want to protect kids. We don't want them to get hurt. Completely understandable stuff. At that point, the scorebook went home, and I had pitched Danny for five innings, and I had pitched Nick for two. 
somehow, when that scorebook was at their house, that got changed. An eraser came out. So the next day when we put the different kid on, the, when we put uh, Danny back to pitch, he was illegal and got thrown out. I had played an illegal player, I got thrown out. They didn't realize Nick was the really good pitcher. We won, there was no run rule. We won 36 to nothing, Nick threw a perfect game. Wow. Different game completely. There's this concept about nice, and I think that the staying with those kids it was the nicest thing I could have done because we look at nice in a really weird way in, in society. Like We like kind things. We know what kind things are. We try to do the right kind of things. We hold doors open for people. We, we do things that you can measure, and they're called kind. But when it comes to nice, how many of you would like for your spouse to say, oh, they're the nicest person I know? <laughs> Not really, right? Because nice is okay when we talk about an inanimate object. That is a really nice jacket. That is a really nice camera. That is a really nice hotel. They make us feel good. There's an emotional connection to nice. But if I say they're a really nice person, for some reason I'm saying that they're not enough. I stayed because I thought that nice meant something different. It meant that I was willing to make an emotional connection with the kids I coached. Nice guys don't finish last. They're playing a different game. At Toastmasters, we really do three things that we help people play a different game. The first one is courage. We help people overcome the fear and give them the courage to do something. Toastmasters clubs are a laboratory of failure. We want people to fail. I coached a team that could give you a master class on failing. <laughs> but they also learned how to win. They learned how to grow. I insisted that we practiced every single Friday before games on Saturday, and I called our Friday practices Failure Fridays. Failure Fridays. I would put them in situations that I knew was just slightly beyond their skill set and help them learn how to deal with that failure so they would learn how to deal with something else and just get a little bit better incrementally every single week. They didn't know that I called it Failure Friday. I called it Failure Friday. It's not nice to say, I'm going to help you fail today. <laughs> but it's okay to say, I'm going to help you grow today. Toastmasters is built on the concept of helping people get better incrementally. But yet, what do we celebrate in Toastmasters? Winning. How many of you know who won the International Speech Contest last year? <laughs> How many of you have ever watched one of the videos for past contest winners? How many of you are getting ready to do an international speech contest at some point throughout your district? We celebrate winning though, right? But is winning the right game we should be celebrating? Three years ago, I moved back to Orlando yet again, this time from South Florida. And I was giving a speech in the international speech contest, one that I had given over the course of the years, and it was called Turn the Page. I think it's a wonderful metaphor about starting fresh with a fresh slate and turning the page. Great concept. It was all about a life that I've had that's particular to me and how I've turned the page. How many of you have ever competed in a contest? Anybody ever go to another club and practice their speech? It, it's a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And what do you do when you do that? You record yourself so you know what happened. You can watch it and you can try to get better. So I did that, and I went to a club that I had been a president of. A club that had 82 members. It's not a corporate club, it's the de facto National Speakers Association for Orlando, because there's not a chapter in Orlando. And all of the professional speakers gather and mentor other speakers. It's a wonderful concept, except there's one guy. There's always that one guy <laughs> who thought it would be great that my speech fits his protege really well. <laughs> So he recorded my speech and gave my speech to his protege. I do not recall that being one of the lessons in Pathways. Fair. 
So I showed up at an area contest and was sitting in the back of the room and I was speaker number two and this other guy was speaker number one and he gets up and he starts his speech. Turn the page. He learned my life. He stole my story. He gave my speech while I was in the room. And he won. <laughs> I'm sorry, do you have your speech recorded that we can see it so we can know who did it first? <gasps> no. What game are we playing at Toastmasters? What game are you playing? Are we care so much about the win and trying to do stuff for the people that are winning? Do we forget about everybody else that's taking that next step forward to get better? The journey that we have in Toastmasters isn't about the trophy, it's about the journey to take the next step towards whatever potential you have. Our members give us the most precious thing that they have in their life, their time. They come to us because they trust that we are going to take, it, take care of them and give them an environment where they're going to be able to show the courage to fail and be held up by others willing to walk beside them. It's the nicest thing we can do. But sometimes we forget to play a different game. The second thing we do, Toastmasters is a different game, but all of us get to play whatever game we want. Just because we are here because we want to help lead, doesn't mean every Toastmaster is there because they want to lead. That's not always a thing. Some of them are there because they want to learn how to interview better. They want to learn how to speak better. They want to have better relationships. They just want to communicate in a more effective manner. We can all play a very different game. But have you ever walked into a club that was blind to what the culture had become in the games that they were allowing their members to play? Fort Lauderdale, three years ago. I walk into a club that's been there for 50 years. Some of their members have been there for 50 years. <laughs> the Toastmaster and the Timer have obviously hated each other for 50 years. <laughs> Average, the combined age between the two of them was something like prehistoric era. <laughs> the Toastmaster wanted the Timer's report at the end of the segment. The Timer wanted to give the Timer's report at the end of the speech. So the Toastmaster said, don't give me the report to later. <laughs> Don't you tell me what to do, mister. <laughs> oh, it's my meeting. I'll tell you whatever I want. <laughs> oh, yeah? Make me stop. <laughs> <laughs> now, you would think that's the end of it, right? So I met Marco's grandfather, apparently. <laughs> kind of like Tim Conway. I thought it was a joke. It had to be at least seven minutes between him leaving the stage and getting to the timer. And everyone else is just sitting there watching, laughing. I'm like, this is horrible. <laughs> and he comes up, and he gets down, and he goes, <laughs> and he touches the guy in the chest, and he falls back, goes, oh. And I turn the Toastmaster around, and I'm like, yeah, come on, let's go back. Let's go back. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And I was crying both with laughter and also pain. It was the saddest thing I'd ever seen. We all have clubs that we walk into at some point and we say, how did that happen? How did we allow that to happen? We think that because we've done things a certain way for a long time, that that's the only way to build a connection and for the experience that we create, we connect, we collaborate this way, within this model. And if it's not that way, oh, then you're wrong, sonny. <laughs> like, these were okay boomers boomers. <laughs> 
but they had just this one idea of how to connect. And it didn't connect with anybody else. What clubs do you have? What experiences do your members have that don't drive them into the doors, but drive them out of the doors? And the third thing, I think the most important part, is that there's a community out there of Toastmasters. Do we like being Toastmasters alone? No, we're here together. How many of you join Toastmasters to be a better Toastmaster? <laughs> Nobody! But yet, sometimes we forget this, the community of Toastmasters that helps us all get better at doing that thing out there by learning how to do something better right here. When I left Orlando, I left a community. Every club around me was 20 strong. There were 15 clubs within a two mile by six mile area, all of them with 20 members, one with 82 members. I moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is not something I ever thought I would say. <laughs> Actually, it's not something anybody thinks they'll say. And I got there and the average club size was six. We could have had a meeting at every table with chairs to spare. There wasn't a community. So I became a division director. And I started trying to build a community because we're better together, not alone. Those kids I coached stayed together as a community of friends. And while half of them are in college now, the other half are graduating this year, they are still as close as ever. Two earn baseball scholarships. Two earn football scholarships. Two earn volleyball scholarships. 16 earn academic scholarships. And Marco is a thespian studying in New York at Juilliard. Wow. He had a flair for the dramatic, right? <laughs> They learned something. They learned how to play a different game. They learned the difference between formal games and informal games. They learned how to invest in the best of somebody else by being the nice guy. Nice guys don't finish last. We're just playing a different game. So my challenge to you is this. What game are you playing? Are you playing a game that only you know the rules of? Or are you playing a game that's helping everybody take that next step? That you're not walking behind somebody or in front of somebody, but with somebody hand in hand to help them understand the best of who they can be. You never know what impact you're going to have on somebody out there. You may never understand it, but know this. If you are playing a different game, you will never, ever lose. Team for our district, and I'll turn it over to Andrea. <laughs> 